Adam Parks here with another episode of Receivables Roundtable today. I am here with a very interesting guest that I think most of you probably already know because she is very popular across the industry, Ms. Amy Perkins, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Phillips & Cohen Associates. How are you doing today, Amy? I'm doing great. It's so great to be here with you. It's always fun to catch up. Uh, definitely appreciate you coming on today. Thank for those you. that might not be familiar with you, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got to the seat that you're in today? Yeah, absolutely. So I started in the industry, let's just call it 20 plus years. Um, we don't have to get too specific at this point, but I started, you know, with a collection agency now known as Alorica, but it was NCO and even before then it was JDR. But anyhow, I started um, as sort of in a management development program, you know, after I'd finished um, my first couple of years of college. And I didn't even know what a headset was. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And I uh, started talking with consumers and helping them through their debt and really found a passion for it and have made a career out of it. From there, I, uh, I was there for a number of years, really learning the ropes of the industry and learning everything about collections, first party, third party, all the different elements at that time and client services and really how to take care of clients and what our clients needed. Um, and then Bank of America <laughs> recruited me because I was very interested in learning what does this look like from the other side? You know, I had been on the servicing side, but I really hadn't been on the front end with an actual creditor. And so um, I did a number of years there and I started out in operations because that's where I'd been on the agency side. And then I really started leaning more and more and more towards risk and then credit strategy and more into strategy and analytics across the collection space. And that's really when I found, you know, my groove. And I started leaning into that. And it started with basic things like learning capacity planning and reporting and things like that. And then, you know, now here I am years later as the chief strategy officer, you know, at Phillips and Cohen. And so, you know, I think what I love about strategy, and I know we're going to talk about innovation is, you know, one, it really scratches that entrepreneurial itch I have to constantly be figuring out, you know, how can we get better? How can we drive how can we, um, you know, really invest and provide services that make a difference for people or even just in the way that we lead, you know, within our organizations, how we, how can we make a difference? And so, you know, I think at Bank of America and I went to Citizens where I really got to learn more about other products. So at Bank of America, I transitioned from ops to strategies, but it had been very credit card focused. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn more about other products. And I knew at Bank of America being as large as it was, and I respect the company so much, it was going to be difficult for me to get really a rotation across different products there just because each group is so big. And so when I moved to Citizens, I really got the chance to lead strategy and analytics across every single product that the company had. So I got to learn really for the first time what auto lending collection strategies needed to look like and how those differed for student loan strategies and home equity loans and mortgages and credit cards. All of them, although similar, they all have their unique rules, regulations, and also they all have their own paths that consumers take. And so an opportunity to learn about that and really round out my expertise was very important to me. And I got a great chance to do that there. Then I said, wait, I've been head down for a really long time here, grinding and working and, and climbing the corporate ladder. And I realized that I hadn't invested a lot of time in one, giving back in the industry and two, just getting to know more people and broadening my, my point of view. And so an opportunity came, you know, to join Inside Arm as the president there. And I, I did a number of years there and started the, the Women in Consumer Finance uh, Conference in partnership, obviously, with Stephanie and her great leadership. And again, an opportunity to use that entrepreneurial spirit to, you know, work with someone who allowed me to kind of take a dream and make it a reality um, and give something back to the group. And then when Phillips and Cohen, this opportunity came, it was the right time in my career. And, and personally, I'd been through a couple of losses of my, I'd been through the loss of both my parents, both fairly unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And I really liked what Phillips and Cohen was doing in terms of their vision. And we'll talk more about this, but to make it easier for those who are left behind when someone passes. Mm -hmm. um, and so the need for sort of my strategic uh, vision and my ability to kind of wrap my arms around things and help guide a collective team toward 
um, and Endpoint just, it, it was the perfect timing for both Phillips and Cohen and for me. And so it's been a great year since, and we can talk more about, about this team and how wonderful they are. But that's been my path here, and it's been a great journey, and I'm really excited about what's ahead. So Phillips and Cohen Associates is a company that I've been working with for, oh, it's got to be well over a decade. They were one of the first organizations that I really started to spend a lot of time with and have worked with in a number of different, I want to say nine different countries. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you guys are in now, but it, I feel like they have really helped me to get a global perspective and helping them with some marketing um, through the years. But can you tell everybody a little bit about Phillips and Cohen Associates and what you guys do there? Sure. You know, um, I do love the story and the history, um, you know, between so many people in this industry. Isn't it great when we all sit down and talk? It's like, oh, it's <laughs> our seven degrees and it's usually yeah. two degrees of separation. <laughs> um, so I always love those. But yeah, you know, Phillips and Cohen oftentimes is known for being really one of the best deceased account servicing agencies out here. But what I came to learn much more once I joined the team is that really this uh, company is very diversified in terms of the services they offer. So mm -hmm. deceased account servicing is really at the heart of where this company started and really has been founded on. And quite honestly, the commitment and the culture that was built around providing compassionate service was the perfect foundation to then build upon that and do all we do now, right? First party collections, third party collections, um, we do uh, debt settlement servicing, and we have lots of new automation and services around that that we're continuing to build from years of having been, you know, in that realm. Um, we purchase debt. Um, we do all the things. And one of the really exciting things is that we're, we're taking that foundational um, deceased account servicing uh, piece of who we are and really saying, what has that taught us through the years and how can we bring what we've been able to build back and say, how do we reinvest that to automate and make these front end parts of the process that historically hasn't been a part of what we've been involved in? How can we look further upstream and say, how can we make this easier for people from the start? Not just how can we make it easier for them at the point that they're already in a complex situation. And so again, the passion that the company has to not just say, ah, oh, we're a stable, great mm -hmm. business, let's continue to do what we want, but is saying, let's figure out how to push the envelope on innovation, both within our existing businesses, but also in businesses that, because they're niche, oftentimes get, oftentimes get overlooked and don't get the investment they need to really maximize their overall benefit that they can have within that particular niche group. And we'll get into that more, but we are, you mentioned the different countries. So we're in eight different uh, markets, you know, physically across the globe. And so I think we keep count of like physically, where are we and how many markets do we service, but we service eight different markets across the globe. And it, it's, that's been a, a wonderful learning experience as well for me. I mentioned divert, you know, getting a, a breadth of experience across products, but this has really given me an opportunity to lead across cultures and also just understand businesses and the way that they operate differently across uh, locations. It's been I think the, the complexity of, of kind of the probate space and then having to do that across all these different countries with all these different roles, you know, it's it's complex enough to operate within the United States and, you know, having different requirements, you know, you might have 50 different requirements on a particular item, right, 50 different states, then start to amplify that by different countries. I, I honestly don't know how you guys do it, but really have enjoyed kind of participating in that. And for those of you that haven't seen it, I did do uh, a receivables roundtable with Howard Enders um, a number of years ago, talking specifically about that international expansion. So we'll link that one below as well. But for today's conversation, Amy, you know, I, I'm constantly watching you guys take a, a really difficult subject and find ways to create not just automation, but to improve that experience for not necessarily the deceased consumer, but their family, their loved ones, and all of the people that are around them. And you were the first person who said the word death tech to me. And I went, well, wait a minute, like that's, that's actually a thing. Like, you never really consider it because it's one of those things that everybody wants to kind of push over to the side and not yeah. really think about until it's a necessity. But you guys are getting out in front of some of these things. You know, what does that innovation process look like internally, like identifying that need and starting to build something towards solving that issue? Yeah, yeah you're exactly right. 
talking about this sometimes, you know, for those of us, and now I've been at it a year, you know, I, I think sometimes we can, we, it's our day-to-day -day discussion, right? And so you get so embedded in it. But what's great is that we can't separate the fact that as leaders and, and those who are, you know, helping push the direction of the company, we've also had these experiences. Very few mm -hmm. of us have gone through life and haven't been touched by death. And if you think about a lot of jobs folks do out there, a lot of times they're providing a service that they haven't necessarily been on the receiving end of that service, mm -hmm. but doesn't mean they can't provide a great service. But the one thing about this is once you've been through it um, and you understand where it's hard and what you experienced and you put the collective experiences of a group of people together like that, you find out pretty quickly where the, where it's hard, where a hard situation is harder because mm -hmm. we've made it harder. Businesses have made it harder. And I think a lot of times, I think, I think the conversation of death is part of what deprioritizes innovation in this area sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, it's a little bit of the unknown, but if you think about large creditors or just any creditor that's out there a lot of times someone who's sitting at the front you know designing a product and coming up with a way to to come up with a solution and a credit card that offers rewards and all these things they're often not thinking about at the very end that, that one day that consumer may no longer be there and what happens is the volume tends to be so small of deceased consumers relative to these huge portfolios that not by anyone's intention, but it tends to become an afterthought. And so then what you have is the people on the other side of those consumers that are saying, hey, I need to let you know something. I need to let you know that my, my person, my mom, my sister, whoever it is has passed. What do I do? And because a lot of companies haven't thought well enough down the process because volume doesn't always demand it, Yep. There's real life experiences happening on the other end of those uh, other end of that phone. And I will tell you when I went through the process, and again, this is back to why we're so passionate about finding solutions for this, is there's a company I won't even work with anymore that was so difficult at the time that my mother passed mm -hmm. to just get through the process of saying she's gone. There's nothing else any of us can do. Um, but it was so difficult with the number of times I had to submit death certificates and information. I was like, oh, you know, how could this be? And so we're committed to saying, hey, look, we've got a solution now that a creditor can snap right into their website and it digitizes the whole deceased notification process, as much or as little of the process as a creditor wants. But at least you have peace of mind that there is a simplified way for a consumer to come to you and let you know that someone's passed and digitally upload that, that death certificate. That's where we're at, right? It's 2022. Mm -hmm. We need to be providing those, that same level of automation to these niche groups because they're, they're real people on the other end having a real life experience, whether it's 50 accounts or 50,000 accounts, it doesn't change the importance of that. Well, uh, you know, it may be a minimum of volume as compared to the size of the portfolio, but I think the level of sensitivity required for that particular process really is what segregates, you know, a high quality creditor from a less high quality creditor, I guess you could say. Um, I know when we first, you know, I started working with Phillips and Cohen Associates, I mean, almost, they were one of the first customers when I started the marketing firm. And one of the projects that I worked on for them was, a, was what the website's called Continued Path. And at, I finished the Continued Path websites and the checklist for the deceased and, and all of these great consumer facing resources, and then had a death in my family and immediately went, oh, let me go pull up all of this information. So I pulled up the checklist, I walked through all those processes and went, wow, like th these guys are, are light years ahead of what anybody else is trying to do in the marketplace. So as you look at that, you know, has the PCA team, uh, Phillips and Cohen Associates, PCA, uh, you know, for short, but has the PCA team, you know, looked at some, like, what's that process look like for new innovation? So you, you've identified this problem, you know that you have a need in the marketplace, you know, how are you addressing that situation? You know, like, are, how are you guys planning it together? Like, are, are you working with the creditors? How, what does that whole thing look like from your perspective? Yeah, it is. I mean, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of cross collaboration and idea generation uh, that's happened. It got really dark in here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the sun must have, I guess the sun went down, so we're adjusting now. 
Hang on one second, maybe. There okay. you go. Am I there? Yep, okay. yeah, you're good. We couldn't make it through without at least one technical difficulty, right? That's okay. Um, but yeah, our process is really, you know, to go out and collaborate, you know, both with future consumers of these products, that we, I mean, uh, customers of the products, meaning creditors and, and others. And, and I think we just, in our own experiences, and we really sit down and think about, you know, and Adam Cohen, you know, our one of our co-founders and co-CEO, um, is a very innovative guy, is always out in the industry um, talking with, we're always talking with funeral home, those in the funeral home uh, industry, really all of those in sort of the death services industry, because mm -hmm. I think there's this shared collective passion for what is our collective weak points as a group, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, as we try to serve a leadership role in that, in those discussions to say, hey, where can we work together to make this whole process easier? So if you think about the new products that we're offering under our new subsidiary, the estate registry, mm -hmm. as we sat down and really said, what, what is needed here really became clear with sort of three different, um, three different steps in the, the pre and post death life cycle. I know it's a terrible, a, a tough way to say, but really what this is, is really about, you know, the very first one, our digital vault is really about what can we do proactively? So in my case, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm single. I have, you know, I want my daughter at the time that I pass, I want everything to be there and ready and available for her. So she doesn't have to go. In my case, I had to break into my mom's laptop and figure out how to find her things. I want my mom, I want my daughter to have a key and our digital vault gives her a key. She unlocks that digital vault and I can set it up. So it automatically notifies the people that need to be notified because I've preloaded that information. So it's all taken care of. And so it will go all the way through the process of notifying everyone. And my daughter should have very, very little heavy lifting um, to get that through. Um, and so if you think about that compared to my experience, like I said, I was breaking into, you know, my mom's laptop trying to figure out what creditors does she have? I don't know what debt she has. I don't know who her car, you know, loan is through any of those things. And so um, at the time that I was, you know, grieving, I had a three-year-old daughter. I had a full-time career. I'd lost my mother, mother suddenly. And now here I was sort of burdened with, um, and I mean that in the best way, but like all of these things while I'm grieving to get through. And so when you ask me, what's the innovation process, I think it's us talking to people who have experienced this and saying, what made it so hard? So that's on the, that's on the, the survivor side, mm -hmm. but for creditors, I mean, look, creditors have a responsibility to look after all of those that they've lended to, uh, living or deceased, right? I mean, we, we still have a responsibility post someone's passing, even though they're not a future revenue generating customer to the bank or to the, to the company that, that is lending them money. But at the same time, you still have a responsibility for those, but also financially, it makes sense for banks because the sooner you can learn that someone has passed, then the sooner the, the, sooner the, the banks or the creditors can limit their exposure to potential fraud or things that can happen when someone is deceased, um, but also can accelerate stopping anything further on that account for everyone's benefit, again, to make it both better financially for the creditors, but also process-wise for those who are existing. So a lot of time spent figuring out how do we make this as streamlined as possible and remove as many of those bumps and hiccups that are tough. It's tough as an adult in general, holding down a life, much less when you're grieving. <laughs> it's definitely not an easy uh, topic to cover, right? It, it's not an easy way to think through these solutions and you really have to have a um, really a special group of people that can work through these kinds of sensitive problems, both, both seeing both sides of the equation, the sort or really three sides of the equation, the survivor, the deceased, and, you know, the creditors involved in the process. And I, I think that you and your team have done a phenomenal job. And I know that you're also doing innovation in other areas of the industry as well, but we'll save that for a future video because I'd like to have you come back on so that we could talk more about innovation because I, I really do learn a lot from every conversation that I get to have with you. Thank you. I guess the last thing I'll say with innovation is if you're out there trying to do it, make sure you walk that process yourself. 
before you put it out. Because sometimes we think we're doing a really great thing automating things and we're just creating different problems and solving old ones. And so, you know, I think for us, that's a guiding principle is that we really want to make sure that the process lives and breathes the way it did in our mind and that our intention of making it easier for people, um, ourselves included, is truly living out in the technology. So more to come. I'm happy to join you anytime to talk more about innovation. I'm with you. It's always a good combo. Awesome. Well, I greatly appreciate it. For those, for those of you that are watching, if you have additional questions that you'd like to ask, feel free to leave those in the comments below, both here on LinkedIn and YouTube. If you have additional topics or specific items that you'd like to see Amy and I cover in a future video, you can leave those in the comments below as well, because I'm sure we would be happy to create additional content for the industry right here on Receivables Info. For now, Amy, thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate you coming on today and looking forward to the next opportunity for us to catch up at a conference. Thank you so much for the invite. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you.